The classic approach to management of cervical insufficiency, which has been the subject of considerable reflection in recent years, is the cervical cerclage, which is simply a stitch that is placed completely around the cervix. Cerclages are categorized as prophylactic or elective, which are cerclages that are placed prior to significant cervical change, usually by 13 to 14 weeks gestation, or ultrasound indicated or clinically indicated, which are cerclages that are placed at the time of the detection of significant cervical change. 80 to 90 percent of the procedures we do now are ultrasound indicated or clinically indicated cerclages. What do we consider to be significant cervical change? Well, usually this is a reduction in cervical length as assessed by ultrasound of 30 to 50 percent or a cervical length that is less than 25 millimeters and certainly less than 16 millimeters. Usually accompanying this kind of change is descent of the membranes into the endocervical canal, as we discussed on our previous session. What are the goals of placing a cerclage? I see several fold. One is to physically maintain or restore the length of the endocervical canal. In the case of a prophylactic cerclage, we would like to maintain that length. And in the case of a ultrasound indicated or clinically indicated cerclage, we would like to actually restore that length. We would like to prevent progression of cervical change and particularly decrease the risk for descent of the membranes into the endocervical canal that will eventually result in complete loss of cervical sufficiency. Another advantage of cervical cerclage is that it allows for timely intervention. By that I mean if a patient should present in preterm labor, it gives us a chance to perhaps interrupt this, giving us the opportunity to delay delivery for a period of time, perhaps to administer corticosteroids for fetal lung maturity, um, or antibiotics to decrease the risk of infection. What are the actual surgical approaches or types of cerclages? The first is the classic Sherrod car cerclage. The second is the McDonald cerclage. And the third is what's termed an abdominal cerclage. The latter we're not going to discuss at all today. And indeed, we're going to focus primarily, after a brief discussion of the Sherrod car, on placement of a good McDonald cerclage. The classic cerclage was the Sherrod car. This approach was first performed using an absorbable gut suture that was soon replaced with non-absorbable permanent suture such as Merceline tape. five millimeters in width. The, the Sherrod car cerclage 
if this is a cervix, requires dissection of the vaginal mucosa off of the cervix anteriorly and posteriorly prior to placement of the cerclage as high as possible around the cervix. The advantages of, an, of a Sherrod Carr cerclage include the high placement Because placement as close as possible to the internal cervical loss increases the likelihood of success. However, there are distinct disadvantages as well to a Sherrod Carr cerclage. It's certainly a more challenging procedure, and this becomes particularly difficult in patients who are obese or having their first babies or have advanced cervical changes. So challenging in difficult patients is certainly an issue. There's a longer operating time. A Sherrod Carcer Clash can easily take 45 to 60 minutes to complete due to, due to the dissection that's required for the placement. At the same time, there's an increased risk for bleeding And the suture material that's generally used, mercelene tape, is much more difficult to pass through delicate tissues and more difficult to remove. This, in my mind, makes Sherrod Carcer clauses and the use of mercelene tape less practical or risky, particularly when there are uh, rescue procedures that involve advanced cervical dilation with membranes visible or protruding through the external cervical os. The McDonald cerclage, on the other hand, is a much simpler procedure. It's a simple purse string suture that's placed at the junction of the vaginal and cervical mucosa. It does not involve dissection of the vaginal mucosa and yet, as I'll show you, can be often placed nearly as high as a Sherrod Carr cerclage. The suture material that is used for these is highly variable. Classically, again, mercelene tape was used to place the Sherrod Carr, or the McDonald cerclage. Nowadays, people will often use proline, number one. Years ago, I began using a double strand of number five ethabond. In fact, this has been my choice for about 25 years. A double strand of this gives you about a three to five millimeter width to the cerclage, similar to that obtained with the mercelene tape. There are distinct advantages to a McDonald's cerclage. It's a very rapid procedure. Under ideal circumstances, once the patient is ready to go, the actual stitch placement might take no more than five to 10 minutes in uncomplicated cases. And by that, I mean cases where the membranes are not protruding or about to exit the endocervical canal. The disadvantages, are the somewhat lower placement than can be achieved with a Sherrod car. With the three greatest reasons for failure being that the suture is not placed highly enough, deeply enough, or tied tightly enough to prevent cervical change and downward displacement of the membranes. One of the other disadvantages of this procedure is when bladder is not dissected above the cervix and rectum below the cervix, there's the fear of increased risk to the bladder or the rectum.
as a result of the cerclage placement. A McDonald's cerclage can be safely done in many cases, if not most cases. In fact, more than 98% of the cerclages I've placed since coming to Greenville Hospital System have been McDonald's cerclages, even under very high-risk rescue situations. The deeply enough and tightly enough parts of the procedure are technical components of good cerclage placement that are contrary to classical teaching. But by placing the cerclage deeply into the cervical stroma, it is much more secure, less likely to dislodge, and goes beneath the major blood supply, so that when you tie the knot tightly enough, you do not run the risk of strangulating the cervix. Indeed, at the conclusion of my McDonald cerclage procedures, I prefer to see a slight degree of cyanosis of the cervix in the end. So what is the approach we use to McDonald's cerclage? It's not all that different from that described in textbooks. But a few key factors are emphasized. Good cerclage placement involves some basic principles of surgical technique. Exposure, identification, identification of anatomical landmarks, good traction on the cervix itself, And perhaps the most important component, other than the exposure, is good counter-traction. Against the tissues attached to the cervix to allow high placement of the stitch and proper identification of the anatomical landmarks. Let me walk you through the procedure as we perform it here. The first step in this is routine placement of a Foley catheter in the bladder. This is done for two reasons. The first is that most of these procedures are done under a spinal or epidural anesthetic. And it takes a while for the patient to have return of normal bladder function. I learned a long time ago that leaving the Foley catheter in place until bladder function and sensation has returned decreases the risk of over distending the bladder that can have longer term complications for the pregnancy. In addition, when there is advanced cervical change with the membranes at or beyond the level of the external cervical loss. Placement of the Foley catheter allows one to fill the bladder with fluid, which can help the membranes retract into the endocervical canal. The next step in the procedure is to provide exposure. And this is done using a weighted speculum and right angle retractors. At this point, the cervix is grasped this being the cervix, on its anterior lip at about the 11 o'clock position on the cervix. I usually use a sponge stick to do this because it is less traumatic in the long run. The cervix is grasped and downward traction is applied 
at the same time that upward traction is applied with the right angle retractors, essentially stretching the cervix out. The first suture is placed just beneath the bladder, and the proper landmark is identified by holding the suture in the needle driver and pushing the edge of the, the needle up against the bladder until resistance is met at this level. The suture is then buried beneath the bladder and the combination of stretching on the cervix and upward placement of the needle beneath the bladder allows for good high placement of the suture material. In more than 400 procedures using this technique we've never had damage to the bladder or the urethra. Then using a sequential technique in which the sponge stick is moved around the cervix and at each step the counter traction is replaced by moving the right angle retractors. The cervical and vaginal mucosal junction is identified by pushing the cervix in and out with the sponge stick and then finally stretching on the cervix again and placing the next stitch. Essentially doing this as we proceed around the cervix. By carefully placing each stitch at the exit point of the previous one, the suture material is buried beneath the mucosal surface. Once the 12 o'clock position is again reached, the suture is drawn snugly through the tissue using a back and forth motion, maintaining traction on the anterior lip of the cervix so that all slack is taken out of the suture and is buried more deeply in the cervical stroma. <laughs>